Uh, again, we start this new book, the book of Genesis, and an often asked question is why? Why study an Old Testament book? After all, aren't we living under the new covenant? How could this be relevant to what I'm going through in my life today? How does this apply to our world, our culture today? Well, I'm glad you asked. First of all, it was Winston Churchill that stated, those that fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And the book of Exodus is truly one of the greatest history books that we have. It is God's word. It tells us how God, the one true sovereign Lord, the creator of the universe and our planet Earth, intervened on behalf of his chosen people, the Jews, and brought them out of bondage in Egypt and brought them to the front door of the promised land, the land that he had promised to Abraham years and years earlier, their future home of Israel. And God would do all that, uh, that he would do all that he would do in this book uh, with great power, but also with great grace uh, as we see him working among his grumbling people. And he would demonstrate the truth of who he is to a group of people who were who are questioning whether God even really cared about them. And so there's a lot of things we'll see in this book that are relevant for all of us today. And after all, they've been living as strangers, as foreigners in Egypt. Uh, at the time of the Exodus, they've been here for over 400 years. And you think if you go back 400 years in our nation, I mean, what do you got? Nothing, really. I mean, barely established 400 years ago. Um, their beloved forefather, Joseph, whom God used in a mighty way to save when he, you know, is there, Israel's only 70 members in their nation. Think about that. Talk about a little bitty nation, 70 people. Uh, he's, God uses Joseph to save them from a deadly famine. Uh, God also raised up Joseph to be second in command over all of Egypt, and so he would save the Egyptians Joseph now has been dead as we uh, start Exodus for over 350 years at this point. And, and so the book of Exodus is really one of the greatest books in the Bible that shows us how awesome, how real, how intimate and powerful the Lord is. Many references from this book are seen throughout the New Testament. Uh, the greatest thing we'll discover is that Jesus Christ is seen throughout the book of Exodus. Uh, this is why the Apostle Paul will say things like this, 1 Corinthians 10, starting in verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, and that's a reference to the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night, all passed through the sea, that's when they crossed the Red Sea, that's all here in Exodus, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same spiritual food, that food was manna that we'll see in Exodus, and Jesus is the true manna that came down from heaven. And all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. And then in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11, a few verses later, Paul says, Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Now, when Paul wrote 2 Timothy just before he was put to death, uh, he was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write these words, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scriptures given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness or instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And the book of Exodus is certainly a big part of the all scriptures inspired by God. Now, Exodus, as you know, is the second book of what we call the Pentateuch, the first five books that Moses wrote, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And, you know, there's no question in my mind who wrote the book of Exodus. Uh, throughout the Old and New Testaments, we read about God you know, gave the law through Moses. And that's what we see here, the Ten Commandments given in chapter 20. But what seals Moses' authorship for me is just simply what Jesus says. He quotes from Exodus. He calls it the book of Moses. Look at the, this verse, Mark 12, 26. 
Uh, this one, Jesus is refuting the Sadducees because they didn't believe in the resurrection. That's why they are so sad, you see. They didn't believe in the resurrection. Uh, Jesus says, but concerning the dead that they rise, but that they rise, have you not read? That's an interesting statement. Have you not read in the book of Moses, in the burning bush passage, how God spoke to him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He'd go on to say, God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And so I trust that God used Moses to write this book. By the way, when Jesus says to these religious leaders, have you not read in the book of Moses, uh, that's quite an indictment against a lot of pastors today that say, oh, we don't need to read the Old Testament. We're under the New Covenant. We don't need the Old Testament anymore. But I would also assume that most of those same pastors are the same ones who say, don't read the book of Revelation. It's a closed book. You know, nobody can understand it. That's their problem, and that's why there's so many anemic Christians in the world today. They don't want the counsel of God's word, the whole counsel of God's word. And so they'll settle for uh, little sermonettes for Christianettes. <laughs> Um, that's how I look at it. Anyway, um, if you remember our study through Genesis, God literally created the entire universe, including planet Earth and Adam and Eve, in six literal days. On the seventh day, he rested. Not that he was tired, but that he just finished what he did, and he just enjoyed what he created. And when God finished his work of creation, he said it was very good. Very good. But it didn't take long for Adam and Eve to disobey God's word and fall into sin. And so things were not so very good after that. And that's because sin and the effects of their sin corrupted the entire universe, uh, especially planet Earth. It, it spread throughout uh, this world. Their sin brought death and destruction in its wake. And by the time we get to Genesis chapter 6, the whole world, it says, is filled with wickedness and violence and that every intent of the thoughts of man's heart was only evil continually. So God would destroy this world with a flood and he would use Noah, who found favor, grace in God's eyes, and he would save Noah and his family, eight on the boat, and God would bring, you know, all the kinds of animals onto the ark. But a few generations later, God would call a man named Abram and his wife Sarai to leave their, <clears throat> their pagan land of Ur the Chaldeans, and God would choose them to be used by God to create a special group of people who would become known as the Jews. Later, they'd be known as the Israelites, the people of Israel. But it's in Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3, that God establishes his unconditional covenant with Abraham and his offspring, and again, it's an unconditional covenant with the Jewish people. He says, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. You shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse those who curse you, who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. That's God's eternal covenant with Abraham. This is why replacement theology is so bogus. God is not done with the Jews, even though they've been, you know, disobedient to the Lord. Jews and Gentiles make up the body of Christ because anytime somebody, whether you're Jew or Gentile, turns to Jesus, you're part of the body of Christ. But he's still not done with the Jewish people. He still has a plan in the future for them. And then later on in Genesis 15, God reiterates this. Verse 5, God will bring Abraham outside and said to him, Look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he that's Abram, believed in the Lord, now he's known as Abraham, and he, the Lord, accounted it to him for righteousness. And that's how anybody saved, by faith alone and Christ alone. He believed God, that's all he did. He believed God's word, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now that promise of God to Abraham would take a long time to develop. You know, look at the stars. Can you count them? No. Well, your children, your offspring are going to be more than you can even number. 
Well, he didn't have any kids when he was given that promise. He was 100 years old. Sarah, his wife, was 90 years old. And they finally have the son of promise, Isaac. Isaac would then marry Rebekah, and then they would have twins, Esau, the firstborn, and Jacob. But God chose Jacob to be the firstborn. And Jacob would have 12 sons and they would become known as the 12 tribes of Israel. But as you know, Jacob's favorite son, Joseph, would be sold by his jealous brothers, and he would end up as a slave in Egypt. But again, what Joseph's brothers meant for evil, God turned it all around for their good. Uh, again, God raised up Joseph to be second in command over all of Egypt. Amazing. And he would be used to provide for and care for his Jewish brethren and all the people of Egypt. And, and so Egypt would literally become, for 400 years, an incubator for the Jewish people there in the land of Goshen, the eastern side of Egypt. And over that time, the Jewish population would grow from those 70 Jews, the nation of Israel, to at the beginning of this book of Exodus, about 2 million Jews over a 400-year period. And so at the very end of Genesis, Joseph dies at 110 years old, and he was embalmed, and he was placed in a coffin. But as you know, that's not the end of the story. You know, God still was not done with his people, the Jews. Egypt was never going to be the land of promise in fact, Egypt represents the world. And keep that in mind as we go through this. Egypt, always in the scriptures, represents just the, the unbelieving world, the unsaved world. It was a place of slavery. It was a place of bondage, affliction, pain, suffering. Sounds like the world. But God had a much better plan for his people um, look at this verse, Exodus 20, verse 2. It kind of summarizes the whole theme here. God says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And that's what we'll see. That's the main theme of the book of Exodus. It's about liberation by God for his Jewish people. And they would, he would liberate them by a mighty hand. God would prepare for them uh, a special task, and that would be to bear witness to the one true living God. Uh, another reason for th them being there is that God would use Moses to write, again, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, and God would use the Jews to write most of the Bible, the Old Testament especially, and eventually, through the Jews, through the tribe of Judah, would come the ultimate Savior, Deliverer, Jesus Christ. And so as we go through this amazing book, uh, we'll see a lot of practical applications because God is still setting captives free. And he is still desiring all of us to experience the fullness of the promised land, which in Exodus they don't experience. They get right up to the border, but their unbelief kept them from going in. So again, a lot of things that apply to us today. Uh, but the promised land, it doesn't represent heaven. It represents the, the, the fullness of walking in the spirit, the fullness of life, being blessed by the Lord, walking in his power. Because they get in the promised land and they're fighting and they're warring and they're destroying. That doesn't happen in heaven. So don't think the promised land is speaking of heaven. It speaks of the victorious life we have in the Lord. Now, before we look at Exodus 1, turn one page back, in most of your Bibles, one page back to the last chapter in Genesis, Genesis chapter 50, because when Moses wrote this, it continued on. There wasn't a break in the action here. In fact, um, well, I'll talk about it here in a moment. It wasn't called Exodus by the Jews initially, but starting in verse 15, go all the way back to... Uh, Genesis 50, verse 15, it says, When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, so Jacob has just died as an old man, they said, Perhaps Joseph will hate us and may actually repay us for all the evil which we did to him. Remember, selling him into slavery. So they sent messengers to Joseph, saying, Before your, fa your father died, he commanded, saying, Thus you shall say to Joseph, I beg you, please forgive the trespasses of 
uh, trespass of your brothers and their sin, for they did evil to you. Now please forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we are your servants. Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. Now, therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. And so, again, in God's providence, he turned all the bad things that happened to Joseph into a great blessing, uh, something wonderful for the, the his family, the Jewish people. You know, this is a great example of Romans 8.28. What does that say? It's on the screen. And we know that all things work together for good to those that love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And so this is a perfect example of God working all things together for good. Verse 22 here, it says, So Joseph dwelt in Egypt, he and his father's household. And Joseph lived 110 years. Joseph saw Ephraim's children. That's one of his sons, Ephraim. So his children to the third generation, the children of Machir, the son of Manasseh, were also brought up on Joseph's knees. And Joseph said to his brethren, I am dying, but God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land to which he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph took an oath from the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. So Joseph died, being 110 years old, and they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. So he gives that promise. God's going to visit you guys. God's going to deliver you. How often do we say, yeah, the rapture could happen at any moment. We're going to be out of here any moment. You know how long Joseph's bones laid there in Egypt before they took his bones to the promised land? 400 years. So God's timing is perfect. They're probably getting discouraged by this time. But now, as we come into Exodus 1.1, it says, Now these are the names of the children of Israel who came to Egypt. Each man in his household came with Jacob. Now, this literally says, and, not now, but in Hebrew, it's, and these are the names of the children of Israel who came out of Egypt. And so that first verse immediately connects it to the end of Genesis. Again, in the Hebrew Bible, it's called the Book of the Names, and it's taken from this first book. It's the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, that gives us the name Exodus. That's the Greek, Exodus means exit, departure. So, verse 2, Reuben. Simeon, here's the names, Levi and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. Somebody missing? Well, yeah, Joseph. You don't read about uh, Manasseh and Ephraim in this section, but he's just talking about those who came down to uh, Egypt. All those who were descendants of Jacob were 70 persons, for Joseph, notice, was already in Egypt, or in Egypt already. Uh, some people try to say, oh, there's a contradiction in the Bible, because when Stephen is given his defense before the, the Jews there in Acts chapter 7, verse 14, he says there's 75 people in Egypt. Well, he was counting, because the Septuagint says 75, and they were already counting everybody that was there at that time after they're there. Here, it's just like these 70 came down. And so it was 75 total, but 70 came down. So there's not a contradiction. Uh, here, it just doesn't include Joseph and his descendants who are already there. Why would you already count them? So be that as it may, verse 6, And Joseph died, all his brothers and all that generation, but the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly, multiplied and grew exceedingly mighty, and the land was filled with them. And so here we jump ahead about 350 years. All of a sudden you go from Joseph dying until now there's just a, a huge group of people. Um, by the time of the actual exodus, there's about 2 million here. By the time we get to the actual exodus, after the death of the firstborn, the Passover, when they finally leave, it's about two and a half to three million Jews. Because 
from this chapter to the Exodus, there's still about 80 years because Moses will be 80 years old when he leads the, the captivity into, cap, you know, into the desert. Be that as it may. Blah, blah, blah. Verse 8. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. Um, when Jacob brought his family into Egypt, it was about, you know, you see so many different dates when you start going through this. I'll try to simplify it. It was about 1875 B.C. when jo Joseph, uh, Jacob and his family go down into Egypt. It was during the 12th dynasty of Egypt. That was also the time when Joseph was second in command over all of Egypt. And then about 150 years later, Egypt was invaded by the people known as the Hyksos, uh, the Hyksos were kind of from Canaan. They're a bunch of group of people, and they invaded and they took over. And they were actually in Egypt, ruling and reigning in Egypt for 160 years. And so they were, you know, taking over the place. And then Egypt, after the 160 years, they retook their land, and that's about 1570 BC. And so Pharaoh's the pharaohs were once again reestablished as the rulers over Egypt. Uh, Moses is born about 1525 B.C., so keep that in mind. That's why, because the Exodus is 1445 B.C. So they go 80 years from the Exodus. They know that's how old jo uh, uh, Moses was when he was born. So 1525 B.C. Uh, the pharaoh at that time was a guy named Thutmose I, uh, Moses would grow up under Thutmose II, and you know, then he's gone. You know, after 40 years in Egypt, he flees for 40 years, and Thutmose II dies. And so when he comes back to Egypt, there's a guy, and his name is somehow pronounced Amenhotep. Close enough. Amenhotep II. He was the ruthless ruler, um, the, the pharaoh at that time of the Exodus, and that's, again, 445 B.C., and that would be the 18th dynasty of Egypt. Now, here we see another reason why it's so important to teach history truthfully, because if this new king, Thutmose I, knew anything about Joseph and the blessing he was to the people of Egypt, how God used him to save the people of Egypt, he probably would have treated the Jews a whole lot different. And so instead of looking at the Jews as a blessing for his country, he now looks at the Jews and their population, and he thinks this is a curse and we need to destroy the Jews. This guy is going to try to literally annihilate the Jewish people. Why? Because he's listening to Satan and not the Lord. Satan is the one that came to steal, kill, and destroy. He, uh, Satan has always tried to thwart God's plan. Where's God's plan first given? Genesis 3.15. This is right after Adam and Eve fell, and this is what God tells Satan in the garden. Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He, that's a reference to Jesus, shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So Satan would uh, bruise Jesus by having him put on the cross, thinking he's defeated, but that's actually when Jesus would crush his head. In other words, God would bring his only begotten son into this world through a virgin birth, the seed of the woman. That's why it's the virgin birth, and Jesus would crush Satan's head. Paul mentions that in Romans 16, verse 20, by the way. And so this is why Satan has done all that he can to try and keep the Messiah from being born. And this is really the main motivation behind anti-Semitism through the ages. Uh, God gave Abraham an everlasting covenant, but Satan still believes that he can break God's promises to the Jews by trying to annihilate them. And you see this throughout the Old Testament. You, you read about this throughout history. Uh, again, Hitler was the last one that tried to annihilate the Jews because Satan knows if he can, then he would make God's word null and void. And so he doesn't learn his lesson. He continues to attack them. Well, look at verse 9. And he, this is the Pharaoh, he said to his people, look, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply, and it 
happen in the event of war that they also join our enemies and fight against us and so go up out of the land. And so by this time, again, the Jewish population is probably equivalent to, or here it mentions even greater than the population of Egypt, the Egyptians. So Pharaoh's worried that the Jews might join forces. And let's say the Hyksos people regroup, they might you know, lure the Jews into fighting with them to overcome uh, Egypt. And so he will start to really inflict you know, the Jewish people with heavy burdens and it'll last for almost 100 years. The previous 300 years weren't so bad for the Jews in Egypt. I mean, they got very, very comfortable there. Uh, they were blessed there. They multiplied there. But especially this last 100 years, it got very, very difficult for them. So look at verse 11. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them, with their burdens, and they built Pharaoh supply. They built for Pharaoh supply cities, Pithom and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew, and they were in dread of the children of Israel. So the Egyptians made the children of Israel serve with rigor. That means harshness, and they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar, in brick and in all manner of service in the field, all their service in which they made them serve was with rigor. So a couple of things to take note of. First of all, the Jews did not build the pyramids. The pyramids will, were built long before this, but they did build these Egyptian, these would be military cities of Pithos and Ramses. Uh, these would be in the eastern side of Egypt, in Goshen where the Jews are living, and they are probably built as military cities to keep the Hyksos people from invading. So Pharaoh, he also saw this as a way to weaken the Jews. Uh, he, he's enslaved them at this point. They're working, uh, he's working them to the point of exhaustion. When it says they made the Jews serve with rigor, it, it, it's the idea of making them serve with such harshness that they become demoralized. And any time you enslave people, whether it's our nation or any other nation that has had slaves, most nations in the world have had slaves, by the way, it demoralizes the people. It just puts them down. They, they think they're second-class citizens, but we're going to see that plan failed because the more they afflicted the Jews, the more they multiplied and grew in numbers. So God's hand was definitely upon them, even though most of the Jews did not realize God's hand was upon them at this time. That's still true for many Christians today. Oftentimes when we go through trials, we go through hardships, and we kind of wonder, where are you, God? You know, we're, where are you in the midst of this? Why am I going through this suffering? Why am I facing this hard time here? Don't you see what I'm going through? Well, of course he does. He promises that he'll never leave us or forsake us. But what happens through trials? Well, James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3 says, My brethren, count it all joy. And I read that and like, really? Okay, James. But it, no, seriously, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Again, this is the meaning behind Romans 8.28. All things do work together for good. All things, no matter what trial you're going through, it can be an illness, it can be, you know, uh, somebody leaves you, or I mean, it can be, you know, uh, just a struggle of some kind that you weren't expecting, uh, whatever that trial is, God can use it for your good. Now, God allowed this to happen to the Jews for a couple of reasons. Number one is we see here they multiplied, they grew stronger even though they were being afflicted. It so really backfired on what the Egyptians were trying to do. But the second thing this did was cause the Jews to want to leave Egypt. You might think, well, that's an obvious reason. People start, you know, enslaving you and beating you and everything else. It's like, yeah, I want to get out of here. Same thing happens in this world. The more we get beaten down as Christians, the more the, the world comes against us, the more we hear people say, I want to go home. You know, I'm ready to go home, and I'm ready to go home, but it's in God's timing. Uh, again, this part of Egypt was like the fertile place in Egypt. This is where everything grew. 
This is where they, the Jews had, you know, probably millions of sheep at this point. And they, their flocks were just healthy and strong. And so God used this affliction to say, okay, you, you like it here now? Well, no, well, no, now we're getting tired of this. Same thing happened in Babylon. Remember after the, the Judah, the nation of Judah was taken up to Babylon, they were there for 70 years. When they leave Babylon, how many go back in that initial rush to go back to the promised land? 50,000. So probably about a million Jews stayed back behind in Babylon. Why? Because they got comfortable in Babylon. Babylon and Egypt, they both represent the world. And that's where we need to be careful because we can get comfortable living in this world. Oh, it's not so bad. You know, things aren't so... It can get a lot worse. You know, we're not like Sudan. And the people in Sudan are like, I want to get out of here, Lord. Take me home. You know, and so it's kind of relative to where you're living and in the, the, what you're experiencing. But th those countries, Egypt here and Babylon, represent living in this fallen, sinful world. This is why you and I are constantly reminded in the Scriptures to realize this world is not our home, but we're looking forward to our heavenly home whose builder and maker is God. That's what we read in Hebrews, the Hall of Faith. Abraham was looking forward to the, the heavenly city whose builder and maker is God. We're just strangers. We're aliens. We're just passing through. We're watching. We should be. We're ready for Jesus to take us home to that place that he has gone to prepare for us. The more this world afflicts us because we're followers of Christ, the more we long to be at home with him in glory. But at the same time, uh, affliction will help us and cause us to grow stronger. So the more the world and our nation turns against Christians, the more the, the world wants us to compromise, the more we will desire to grow, hopefully stronger in the Lord and not compromise with the world. I mean, we see this constantly in the book of Acts. The more the early church was persecuted, the stronger they got, the, the more they multiplied. And we see that in the book of Revelation. Remember the church of Ephesus, that first century church, followed by Smyrna, Smyrna, was the church representing the persecuted church, and Satan was trying to crush them. He had six million Christians put to death in about a 250-year period under the, uh, the Roman emperors, and yet the church grew strong and healthy at that time, so Satan knew, well, I can't crush them out, because it's like trying to stomp out a fire on a windy day. What happened? The more you stomp on it, the more embers fly and start other fires. That's what happens under persecution. That's why the church was so strong for those 250 years. And then the next church was what? Pergamos, thoroughly married. That's when the church became the official religion of the Roman Empire. And that's when it got really, really weak because it was compromising with the world. And so I don't look forward to persecution, but if it comes upon us, and it certainly could, I know God will use it in mighty ways because it has a tendency to purify us. It has a tendency to wake us up to what's really important. It causes the church to get serious about proclaiming the gospel. So they put the burden on the Jews here. They enslaved them, and yet they continued to grow. Well, look at verse 15. Then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, of whom the name of one was Shipra, and the name of the other Pua, and he said, When you do the duties of a midwife for the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stools, basically two rocks that the women would sit on, if it is a son, then you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, then she shall live. So not only was this pagan king, the pharaoh of Egypt, trying to control the Jews by enslaving them and working them to death, here he tries to control the Jewish population by killing all the baby boys. Can you imagine a civil government doing such a thing? Exactly what our government's doing. We're not a civil government. Are you kidding me? Here, Pharaoh is trying to kill baby boys because the baby boys grow up to be men. These men can grow into soldiers, and he's trying to eliminate all the Jewish baby boys. That's how he's trying to eliminate the Jews. And then they would just have the daughters that were born just mingle in with the Egyptians, and they would become part of Egypt. 
And so we're going to try to stomp out the Jewish population by destroying all the baby boys. Amazing. What a horrible time this was. This is ethnic cleansing at its core. So he speaks to these two Hebrew midwives. Their names are interesting because Shipra means beauty and Pua means splendor. And he orders them to kill every baby boy when he is born. Now these two women were probably the leaders of whatever birthing guild, you know, midwife guild they had back then. Because, you know, with two and a half million Jews, you're not going to have two women running all over the place trying to, you know, do this to the baby boys. But they're probably the head over these midwives. And in reality, this is no different than partial birth abortion. Baby's born, they would crush its head. Or in a little bit, we'll see they would throw the babies into the Nile River. No different than what our country does. I mean, it's horrible. This is a government-sanctioned order. This is from the top ruler, Pharaoh. You must do this. Are we to obey the government? Yes. Most of the time. Uh, this is a tricky thing. You know, the Bible is very clear. We are to obey our governments. Romans 13 verse 1 says, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. And we know the governing authorities are supposed to be representing God to the world, to the nation they're overseeing. 1 Peter 2.13, it's not on the screen, but it says we are to submit to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. So that's the rule. That's God's command. God created government. Again, it's supposed to be for our good, but is the government always for our good? Obviously not. Are there exceptions to this rule to always obey what the government says? Absolutely. But here's another thing Peter will go on to say in 1 Peter 4, that make sure if you are going to suffer as a Christian for disobeying, that it's because you are living righteously, not because you're being a jerk, not because you're a murderer or busybody in other people's matters, Peter says. Make sure if you're going to disobey, civil disobedience, make sure it's for godly reasons. Look at verse 17. Here's a great example. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the male children alive. So the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this thing and saved the male children alive? And the midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are lively and give birth before the midwives come to them. Therefore, God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very mighty. And so it was because the midwives feared God that he provided households for them. Midwives back then would not have children or could not have children, but because of their obedience, God blessed them with families, with children. This is the first example in the Bible of what we call civil disobedience. In other words, refusing to obey an evil law because of a higher good. We've seen it throughout the Civil War, throughout the Civil Rights. We've seen civil disobedience, and it's been a good thing. You have to sit in the back of the bus. That's the law. Rosa Parks said, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not an inferior to you. Civil disobedience, disobeying the law for a greater good. As Christians, for us, refusing to obey a government mandate when it violates and contradicts God's word, that is when we refuse. When somebody says, this is what you have to do, but it goes against God's word, then we say, no, I'm not going to do that. This is a great example of Shipra and Pua. They were ordered to kill all the Hebrew baby boys, but they feared God. That literally means that they knew God was a creator of life. They knew God was pro-life, so to speak. 
They knew God was the one who created every human being in the image and likeness of God. And so in reverent awe of God, they did not do as the king commanded them. Um, this is a great example of some verses here. Proverbs 1, verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs 8, verse 13. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogance and the evil way and the perverse mouth I hate. That's what the Lord says. Proverbs 9, verse 10. Certainly applies to Shipra and Pua here. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. They understood the heart of God. We don't destroy babies when they're born. I mean, they knew the heart of God. And, and this one certainly applies. Proverbs 29, verse 25. The fear of man brings a snare. You better obey Pharaoh. That's the fear of man brings a snare. But whoever trusts in the Lord will be safe. These women were safe because they trusted the Lord. God bless them because they trusted the Lord and did not obey the wicked mandate of this government. Uh, Proverbs 6, 16 certainly applies because people want to know, well, did God bless them because they lied? Well, did they lie? I don't think they lied. I think they slowed down. I think they just drugged their feet. I think they might have liked just kind of, oh, what's happening over here? I hear maybe somebody's having a baby here while well, somebody's having a baby over there. They didn't lie. I mean, we know God doesn't love like lying. It says, uh, Proverbs 6, 16, these six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. Proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, Pharaoh. A heart that devises wicked plans, Pharaoh. Feet that are swift in running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, one who sows discord among the brethren. So I don't think they lied. I, I think they just slowed down. And they were probably true. God blessed these Israelite women, and they popped out babies left and right. And God just blessed them tremendously. Another great example of civil disobedience, it's in the book of Daniel. Remember when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they refused to bow their knee to the 90-foot gold statue that King Nebuchadnezzar made of himself. And he says, when you hear the music, everybody, you were required by the leader of the nation, bow down and worship it. Well, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are like, we're not going to bow down and worship this thing. No way. So we read this in Daniel 3, verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, you know, I'm going to throw you in the fiery furnace. Well, if that's the case, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us from your hand, O king, either through death or sparing them. But they knew one way or another, God's going to deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, in other words, if we burn up, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. God did bless them. God did rescue them. God delivered them. They experienced their own exodus. How? Well, Jesus appeared in the fiery furnace with them. That's what Nebuchadnezzar said. Look, uh, we threw three in there. Look, there's a fourth, and the fourth looks like the Son of God. And it was. Jesus was with them in that fiery trial. Now, for all of you who are teachers, doctors, nurses, anyone else whom the government may try and force to do something that you know is not pleasing to the Lord, realize this. God knows how to protect and deliver and bless those who live for Jesus. And we're seeing so many that are being persecuted because they refuse to do what the evil society is saying. Uh, another example, Daniel in chapter 6, the government said, you shall pray to no one but the king, King Darius, for 30 days. Were they trying to slow a curve down? Are they trying to flatten a curve? 30 days, you can't pray to anybody but the king Darius. 
Daniel's like, are you kidding me? First thing he did, he goes and prays. So he gets arrested, and Darius was upset. He goes, oh, I was an idiot. I shouldn't have made that call. I love Daniel. So Daniel knew he gets thrown into the lion's den. God was with him. God protected him. Just like Proverbs says, he knows how to save those who are his, and God delivered him from the lion's den. Paul says this, Galatians chapter 1, verse 10, For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I still please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. You know, you got to serve somebody. You're going to be serving the enemy or you're going to be serving the Lord. If you're bond the slave of Jesus, then you just serve him. When Peter and John were arrested twice for preaching Jesus throughout Jerusalem, the authorities said, you got to stop. You can't do that anymore. It's a mandate. You can't preach about Jesus in Jerusalem. We order you to stop. So what was their answer? Twice. Acts 4.19. Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. That is conviction. That's walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. I don't care. You can lock me up. That was their attitude, but we're not going to stop. God's already told us what we need to do. They get rearrested in Acts 5, and Peter and the other apostles answered them. This is Acts 5, 29, and they said, We ought to obey God rather than men. Again, civil disobedience. If it's a godly thing, you can't make up your own thing. It's like, well, I don't want to do 65 miles an hour. I want to do 90 miles an hour. Well, then you're being a jerk. That's a lousy witness. You know, we're to obey the laws. So I'm not saying anarchy. God does not support anarchy. But God's word takes precedence over man's word, over what man says. So look at verse 22. We'll close here. So Pharaoh commanded all his people. So the midwives weren't doing it. So he commands all his fellow citizens. The, the Egyptians saying, Every son who is born you shall cast into the river, and every daughter you shall save alive. So here's another horrific law. Pharaoh turns the population against each other so that they would spy on, that they would police their Jewish neighbors. And then he gives the Egyptians the authority to kill Jewish baby boys. Have we seen this in history recently? Yeah, exactly what happened in Nazi Germany. They were to report on those who were hiding Jews, trying to save Jews during the Holocaust time. Horrible stuff. It's the direction our government was going. Um, when Megan was in Hawaii during the COVID, they would track, she flew back to Hawaii, and then they took her phone, they you know, did something with her phone so they could track where she went. And they even told neighbors, if you see somebody out there walking on the beach, you were to report them. Seriously? The safest place in the world is a beach in Hawaii by yourself. And yet they were policing their own. I mean, it's crazy. We'll stop here, obviously. But let me leave you with three ideas as we begin this amazing book of Exodus. Number one is, every Christian needs to make their own exodus. What do I mean by that? You need to escape. You need to exit this world. You need to have a plan for not compromising with the world around us. That might mean you leave your old life behind. Don't get caught up in the things of the flesh any longer. Sometimes that means leaving old friends that are trying to pull you back into the world, leaving old places that are a trap to you, leaving things behind because those things are not healthy for you. God has better things for us in the promised land, the fruitful life of walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. So the second thing is afflictions and trials are inevitable. Jesus said in this world you'll have tribulation. Take courage, I've overcome the world. But you're going to go through stuff and so cling to the Lord. God allows these things because all things do work together for our good, for His glory. And when you go through trials, a lot of times it helps us, you know, clarify what's really important in our lives, helps us prioritize our lives. These things help us um, to strengthen our character so that we don't live like the world around us. And He's wanting to equip us for the future that God has for us. And then the third thing, 
I believe the most important thing is we need to believe and trust that God's ways, God's will, God's word, it's infinitely greater than anything this world has to offer. And the closer Jesus comes to coming for his bride, you and me, the crazier this world's going to get. So we need to really hold fast to the things of the Lord. We need to have a biblical worldview. So be wise, be respectful, but don't give in. Don't cave in. Be a good witness for Jesus. And as a side note, always remember where the Supreme Court really lies. It's not in Washington, D.C., the Supreme Court is in glory. The Supreme Court is God himself. And he's given us the mandate how we should live. He's given us everything we need, it says, for life and godliness. It's found in his word.